Today, I am joined by Nathan Kaufness. Uh, Nathan is the Leverholm Early Career Fellow in the Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Cambridge. He works in the philosophy of biology and ethics, and he is a man in trouble with both the left and the right. An interesting position to be in <laughs> as, a, as a philosopher and someone who's, who's concerned with so-called uh, third rail topics. Um, welcome. Welcome, Nathan. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm glad to have you on. I mean, you've been, um, like I said, an, an interesting person just because you've, you're kind of uh, seen as a contrarian by both sides. Um, you are someone who looks at topics that the left tells us we shouldn't look at. It is unethical to look at. And you look at them so closely that you reach conclusions that the right doesn't really like to look at because obviously the the right or maybe more the uh, fringe right um, has drawn its own conclusions based on its own kind of set of uh, thinkers that are outside of the, the the mainstream and they're not really looked at by the mainstream. Uh, and those conclusions, you know, like to sit unchallenged because no one really wants to look at them. So we're in a, in a strange place where you've said, okay, I'm just going to wade into these discussions and I'm going to, um, yeah, be essentially the person to try to unknot some of these, some of these discussions. And by that, I'm I'm speaking about um, your two main areas of of scholarly interest: um, the importance of studying race differences in intelligence, and also um, the so-called Jewish question, which is interesting to people on the right. So um, I got in trouble on uh, the left and the right for making basically the same argument in two different contexts. First. Um, uh, why is there a disparity between uh, blacks and whites um, for which uh, white people are uh, often blamed? And then, um, of course, that uh, my answers to that question were welcomed uh, by, uh, by those on the right, disliked by those on the left. Uh, I made the same argument uh, with respect to Jews and uh, and non-Jews, uh, namely that these differences are uh, largely uh, the, the consequence of IQ differences. Uh, and uh, of course, there are many complexities, but IQ is, a, uh, I think, the most important factor. Um, and so that was disliked by people on, on the right. People who liked the, the first paper disliked uh, the second one and vice versa. Yeah, that, that that is interesting to me because I feel like um, IQ is kind of like the 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 third rail, um, but yeah, and and people concerned with uh, with the so called Jewish question, it is as well. It's uh, I, I often get in, in the comments to my videos, you know, people showing up and saying, okay, the the higher Jewish IQ, higher Ashkenazi IQ is a myth. It's been debunked. Um, <laughs> that I'm just going to say, you know, the reason I went into this field of recording podcasts on these, you know, strange, esoteric, um, forbidden topics is because my experience of the world contrasted very much with what I saw reported as, you know, as or what I uh, felt was being expected of me to believe. So it, to me, when someone comes in the comments and says, oh, no, this has been debunked, it's the same as someone's, let's say, I mean, coming from, in from the left and saying, okay, crime statistic, FBI crime statistics have been debunked. This contrasts completely with my experience of the world because I, you know, just, just knowing the amount of extremely intelligent, like just cognitively sophisticated Jewish people that I have personally encountered and then knowing proportionally what their population size is in the, in the different countries that I've worked in, it is insane for me to believe that. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's the same. It's basically the same, um, you know, thought process that motivates, uh, you know, those on the left who blame you know, whites and say there's no difference. Um, and then, you know, everything that goes wrong, they find a way to implicate whites. It's exactly yeah. the same uh, process. It's, exactly. It sounds to me like, you know, there's that, um, I don't know if it's a, it's a black Hebrew Israelite or someone has a theory that white people were invented by this mad scientist, Yakub, you know, obviously a black scientist and, you know, they in, infused them with all sorts of demonic properties. And to be honest, the, that caliber of comment sounds to me like that theory. It's always like, you know, we have to somehow think about this in a way where this is kind of a, a an, an evil imposition on us as as the the worthy population 
and we're actually better than than these people. But you know, there's there there are reasons, esoteric reasons, why this is not the case in reality. I I mean, of course, um, you know, there's some uh, there is some basis to some of the things that the JQers are saying. Of course, right? so, and I want to go into that, of course, but I'm just just this one particular thing that keeps popping up. You know, oh, this is debunked. I agree that you know the you know the so-called Jewish question needs to be it it begs for an answer this answer is not being given by anyone i mean you know just walking through life encountering you know nobel prize winners you know all sorts of people in and higher up positions and banking and all sorts of things one starts to wonder <laughs> what exactly is going on and no one really wants to provide an answer um, from a more establishment perspective. The answer is, you know, don't even look, you anti-Semite. How can you even contemplate such a question? And obviously... So this I, is- at, at one point, the heads of all eight major film studios in Hollywood were Jewish. And Abraham Foxman, who was then head of the ADL, said, we should say that they happen to be Jewish. Uh, <laughs> so a, there's nothing nothing to think about nothing to uh, uh, for him and you know I've actually um my even though I was sort of on the politically correct side uh when it comes to the the Jewish question um actually my work has become somewhat unpopular among um the the left um because I'm normalizing uh a biological explanation for group differences. Uh, so at a certain point, some people realized that and they kind of uh, turned against my uh, my JQ work. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's not surprising because, the, you know, even the, the left feels this. Uh, they know that if even a sympathetic biological explanation opens the door to also to other implications, you know, because I mean, I think, you know, if, if you address the Jewish question um, head on in the way that you have, I mean, it's, you know, you, it doesn't take a very high IQ to realize what the, you know, the next implications are. Um, you know, if, if you have overperforming groups that are so because of IQ, then you obviously will probably have underperforming groups that are so of IQ. And I think that's even uh, not maybe more controversial, but yeah, it's, uh, it's not, uh, uh, it's just, yeah, peop- it's, it's maybe more um, charged because, you know, it, it really does impact people's lives a little bit more. I mean, who the, who the you know, CEO of BlackRock is, is an important thing and people think about it. But, you know, in, in your day-to-day interactions, it's more important, <laughs> you know, to, to maybe consider some groups that you interact with on a daily basis. Well, of course, their argument is that um, these... Uh, you know, big ideas about multiculturalism and mass immigration and all that kind of stuff was, uh, you know, were Jewish ideas. And of course, they can point to prominent Jews who um, who promoted these things. So, um, you know, if you've kind of trained yourself only to notice the Jews, um, or if that's your your information sources are only uh, telling you about the the Jewish examples. Then uh, it can look like uh, you know this would be an explanation for uh, how we got here. But uh, you know I go into arguments for why I uh, I don't think that's correct. Yeah, and your starting point is what you consider to be kind of the the, the most steel manned, most complex argument for the so called kind of strong Jewish question, the, the the culture of critique by by Kevin McDonald. Um, and what you do is you go through his arguments and you you know you provide counterpoints and and kind of break down and say, okay, this is you know, a little bit weaker than we thought. And your conclusion is that um, his idea that Judaism is a is a group evolutionary strategy is not founded on very good evidence. Is that correct? Right. So uh, McDonald, he says that Judaism is a group evolutionary strategy, that Jews have genetic and cultural ad- adaptations to undermine Gentile society for their own benefit, and that um, the uh, Jewish-led liberal intellectual movements in the 20th century were part of this strategy. And 
that these Jews pursuing the, uh, the group evolutionary strategy were a necessary condition for the triumph of leftism. So without Jews, we would not have gone in this direction, McDonald says. Yeah, I mean, there there are obviously, like you said, a lot of prominent Jews who were foundational to a lot of these movements on the left. Um, just in, in my experience, I, I, you know, being on kind of in right wing circles, I would say, you know, a good twenty percent of anonymous and non anonymous people who are um, who are prominent in even so called far right circles are Jewish. This is obviously also an extreme over representation compared to you know the, the base rate of the population. Um, what this tells you is tells you that you know this you know there's a meme online that you know you need to do early life check when you see someone who's being subversive and um, subversive in the sense not not in the sense of the show but in the sense of you know subverting Western culture, destroying civilization. I mean, I encourage you to do an early life check on your favorite you know if if they're not anonymous, but you know. I happen to know a lot of the anonymous people that know kind of what their what their background is. Um, do an early life check on the on the uh, the other types of subversives as well, and you'll be quite surprised that quite often you're dealing with with Jewish people. And you know, obviously talking to people in kind of these intellectual milieus and stuff, it does often feel that ideology itself is kind of the the battleground of high verbal IQ people um, just sparring with each other. And a lot of these people tend to be Jewish. On both sides. Yeah. So, um, one thing. So, in my uh, original paper, I highlighted IQ as the main factor. I think that is uh, the main factor. But there was uh, there was some sort of selection pressures for IQ in the Jewish population, particularly Ashkenazi population. Uh, so, presumably, it was for succeeding in. Uh, business or Talmud study, some combination of those things. Um, and those selection pressures would have also selected for other traits that are relevant to success in those areas, not only IQ. So I think it's clear uh, that there are personality differences, uh, maybe other cognitive differences that aren't uh, detected by uh, perfectly detected by IQ tests. So uh, you look at a field like chess, which has a very low correlation with uh, chess ability and IQ have a very weak association. Um, I think Gary Kasparov, uh, his IQ was measured by Hans Ising to be 135, which is, you know, top 1%, but doesn't explain how he's was at that time the best chess player in history. Um, uh, but Jews have been about one and a half of uh, world chess champions. Difficult for uh, you know the ethnic networking theory to explain how that could happen. I don't know how uh, you know support from other Jews can make you win the chess match. It says there's some other personality or cognitive traits that are also playing a role in Jewish success, even an IQ of something like 110, 112 is not high enough to explain the extent of Jewish overrepresentation. So there's something else going on. And I think there are examples of Jews who don't have um, tremendously high IQs, like Stephen Jay Gould, who, um, you know, who said that he didn't do, you know, particularly uh, well on IQ tests. Uh, but he was a very intense g guy. He was very verbal. He was, he was a good writer uh, in some sense, um, very clever politically. So there, there are these other, these other traits that, uh, you know, they're not necessarily good or bad in themselves. They're just, were correlated with, uh, they were probably selected for the same reason as uh, IQ, and they're also uh, playing a role. Yeah, I think this this makes a good point about uh, IQ as a kind of a, a necessary but not sufficient, or just kind of a, a fraction of you know what what we online call or Steve Saylor calls human biodiversity, which is something that we 
really don't know that much about. IQ is just kind of this, you know, very shiny proxy measure for other aspects of maybe, you know, maybe there's components of personality in there that we can't detect, but it does essentially predict life outcomes in, in a very, in a very robust way, which doesn't really happen with many other things. And I think with social science, it doesn't really map onto that. So um, I think that's important. I think like that's, that's why your work and the work in this field is, is really important because um, it's easy to dismiss the field because there really isn't that much work being done. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's a weak field because people just don't want to look into these, into these problems. Um, but it's, yeah. It's yeah and the thing is people who, you know, are smart, uh, usually have other opportunities. Um, and, uh, you know, to choose this route, um, it, it can potentially be a big uh, sacrifice for them. So, yeah. You know, how how do you see this? You know, you've chosen this route. You know, you're one of the few people who you know uh, attempts to look into this. I mean, I'm sure this has had consequences in in your own life. But uh, how do you see your decision of uh, you know participating in this discussion now with the with the benefit of hindsight? Well, uh, I'm in my case, it wasn't a decision. I it's just. <laughs> I see this as an important topic, so I, I, I comment on it. I didn't, um, now, I, I mean, there's no point for me uh, to, you know, be involved with uh, scholarship and academia if you, if you can't do that. You know, of course, if I had different interests, then I would have had a smoother, of course, no one wants to hear me complain now, the, the Lever Hume uh, uh, early career fellow at Cambridge. Um, but, oh, okay. It has been uh, a bit tough behind the scenes, but, um, of course, yeah, I, I, uh, you know, some people had suggested that I, um, wait uh, until I get tenure and then I can talk about these things, which, uh, I mean, maybe that's, uh, there's some logic to that. Uh, r r advice, but I mean, tenure is years and years away, um, and uh, these things need to be said now. So, you know, when I first started uh, comment commenting on these issues uh, some years ago, I I did try to be a little. Uh, maybe what I would now think of as overly cautious and, you know, including many qualifications about what it can't be proved, uh, you know, these things can't be proved uh, with uh, certainty. And so there's still reason to be skeptical. Or, But I, I, in the last, I, I stopped doing that. I, you know, I just, I call it like I, like I see it now, which is that, um, you know, differences uh, are are clearly um, have some uh, genetic basis. It wouldn't be controversial if it weren't for the the political implications. And uh, you know, people who kind of to try to dance around the issue, um, it doesn't fool anyone anyway. And people people can see what you you think mm -hmm. so it doesn't fool anyone in, in academia but it does it does fool the, the the general public which can't wait to just be relieved by from the burden of this problem because you know you just want an expert to say you know and they'll say you know oh race is a ill-defined category okay that's you know the, the 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 burden of the problem has been relieved because they're like yeah okay there's no such thing as race iq is uh you know is a skewed metric doesn't really measure what it says it measures you know oh, relief from the problem this is a you know one of those problems that you know, kind of people have an intuition about, but they don't want to confront. And then if you have the, the, the public facing experts saying, actually, don't worry about it. No, it's all pseudoscience. Um, you know, the, the fact that you're not fooled and people may be, you know, within the, the uh, specific sub subdivisions of academia are not, not fooled. They kind of know, um, doesn't really, uh, yeah, doesn't really have that many political implications if kind of the so-called consensus just says, okay, don't, don't worry about it. Uh, well, uh, and the uh, political implications are 
you know, the big, the big issue. Uh, and you have uh, almost no serious uh, work being being done on to address these questions. Um, and uh, you know, as as we discussed, you know, most of the you know smart people are uh, staying away from these areas. Uh, you know, it's, uh, and a consequence of this is that it's being discussed, you know, mainly by people with nothing to lose or people who just want attention um, or people who really have, you know, the bad motives, uh, you know, the stereotypical bad motives attributed to them by, uh, you know, uh, uh, leftists. Uh, so when people come to recognize certain uh, Certain facts, they uh, they uh, often um, you know start following people who I don't think are uh, very worthy leaders. Um, so the uh, you know the cost of the taboo is not um, uh, or of the noble lie about race is not uh, really appreciated. Uh, by people who I don't know, maybe they have good intentions, some of them. Uh, but uh, uh, it's not. I don't think it's going to have a good outcome in the long run. Yeah, I think a lot of people on the left overestimate their power of suppression. Um, I think it, it worked if you know you had one major outlet putting out you know, the, the information for everyone. Everyone watched the evening news and watch Dallas for entertainment and, you know, no one was talking about race and IQ there. But now, if you have a certain intuition about the real world, you can just strap, you know, maybe not into Google, but put it into Yandex and you'll, you'll get your answers right away. There are a lot of people, like you said, who, who, um, yeah, who derive notoriety from, from talking about this stuff. Um, and because there's not really real research around it, there's, you know, people can essentially say, pretty much whatever they want about, about, you know, around kind of, you know, do, do uh, play around these, with these subjects without really any, any rigor. And yeah, it's, it's not, yeah, it's not really possible to ring fence this stuff anymore. I mean, this, this will have to break. This is, you know, this news will break soon because it's not, yeah, it's impossible to contain. Well, I, I don't know that I'm, uh, I'm not sure, uh, you know, where this is going to go. I and mean, because the powers of censorship, it's true. Theoretically, the information is there, but if it's not presented in a way that people can take seriously, um, you know, it's very hard, uh, for, to, for, to reach the vast majority of people. And, you know, people are taught, uh, now from you know, the time they're born and sent to, you know, go through the education system where one of the main messages is, uh, you know, the, uh, the orthodox narrative about uh, race and race differences. Um, it's very difficult. You know, if somebody has been through, uh, you know, 20 something years of, uh, that kind of, um, education, and then you present them with, some chart or uh, some evidence from genetics. Uh, you know, that uh, people, people can resist it for you know, quite strongly. Um, and, uh, you know, the system of incentives is uh, very effective at steering people away from this. So, you know, I, I'm not sure what's going to happen. I think there's some possibility that, that something will happen and the floodgates will open and sort of the right um, uh, political figure will come along to articulate these ideas. Now, if that happened, I think 
there's a very high probability that things would go in a negative direction. Um, so I mean, the idea of race differences, the idea that groups are different, um, that, uh, that can lead to, uh, you know, bad situations. Uh, but the leftists aren't wrong about that. Um, and I think we're increasing the probability of that bad outcome by, uh, by enforcing the taboo and driving these conversations underground and uh, putting in them in the hands of uh, the wrong people. Yes. I mean, have you considered what um, kind of the, the likely, I mean, you said it could lead to bad outcomes, so what kind of the, the maybe the more benign version of, okay, making this stuff common knowledge is because it, it really strikes at the heart of kind of the egalitarian premise that we have under, you know, so-called democ- democratic liberalism. I mean, if, you know, if you look at the difference in IQ between, let's say, two standard deviations, let's say, you know, let's say we go Ashkenazi and, you know, let's say African-Americans, just the measured on average group averages. We're not talking about individuals here, but, you know, there are certain implications of on democracy, on, you know, what exactly it is we're, we're, we're doing. I mean, you know, you know, there are many questions about democracy itself to be asked, but um, yeah, there, there are a lot of implications downstream from this. Um, And uh, yeah, I wonder what, what the more, the more, yeah. What, what would happen if this was just, you know, every you know, if if you were a five year old and you just knew that this is you know it's the case, you're being being taught this at, uh, at you know primary school. Um, yeah, what what would that world uh, look like? Well, um, I think that as long as you have um, identifiable groups with conspicuously different outcomes, you know living together, that is going to lead to uh, problems. Um, it's just uh, there will be large numbers of people who don't accept that this is the result of natural differences. No matter what you tell them, uh, no matter what the evidence is, it's uh, people believe what makes them feel good, like or they're more likely to believe what makes them feel good. And um the idea of natural differences mm, can feel bad so uh the idea that your group is you know has worse outcomes than another um for that reason you know if somebody comes along and says no it's because they're uh they're unjust they've uh, wronged you um i think that's always going to uh, appeal to large numbers of people. So the question is, how do we, um, how do we work something out? Yeah, and I think you know, there's an argument to be made that you know you don't really need to win over the the masses with this argumentation because it is you know there's layers of sophistication to to these analyses and all this. Uh, that you know, you just need to win over su- sufficient number of a certain type of elite, who will then kind of cause a little preference cascade within their own institutions, and then that will become uh, information there, and that's going to be encoded in whatever new regime we're going to be having. Um, yeah, so I don't. It, it isn't necessary for you know every every person to learn it, and then from that new elite, it's going to trickle down into television and you know all all of the the mass media that we've grown up on, you know, all the, every movie is footloose, every story is about the underdog, you know, overcoming the authority figure, the crusty religious person. And then, you know, it's, it's, you know, the same thing. There could be, you know, an alternative script that, you know, is just hammered into people for, you know, for the longest time. Um, yeah. The question is, what would that world look like? Uh, that's, uh, that's an, <laughs> an interesting one to contemplate. Maybe, maybe we'll have that experience. Maybe we won't. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think this is the kind of question that philosophers should be uh, thinking about. Um, and uh, I've tried to encourage some uh, discussion of these issues in philosophy. But uh, 
I mean, there has been a lot of discussion, uh, but not re- entirely the, the kind I was hoping for. Um, discussion like, what are we going to do to the journal editors who accepted Kaufness's paper? Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, should the paper be retracted? That kind of thing. Um, but I was hoping, you know, that people would, would think more about the ideas and, uh, um, and uh, you know, even just think if they don't want to explicitly endorse the idea of racist differences then say, well, what would the implications be? You know, uh, in philosophy, um, you know, we spent a lot of time, you know, kind of talking about the same ideas for, uh, you know, decades or centuries or, um, and, uh, you know, it would, you would think that you know, people might welcome an opportunity to talk about a completely new uh, issue. Um, uh, but yeah, people are not that, uh, excited about it, unfortunately. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it takes a, a particular type of personality to be excited by the, you know, the actual subject matter of a, of a, of a subject and then not just by the status opportunities that it offers uh, because, you know, you have a certain talent in that direction. And I feel like m- probably most people in, involved in most disciplines are of the, the latter kind. I mean, the people who just, you know, not necessarily, you know, just instinctively gravitate towards that and then they see kind of where the wind is blowing and then they position themselves according to that. And then, um, yeah, like I said, I, I don't think people, you know, cynically do this, but like you said, people like to believe the things that um, are, yeah, gentle on their egos. Yeah. Well, and uh, with academics, one has to think about, well, who are the academics? Like, how were they selected? People who like school, you know, are usually uh, intelli- in philosophy, they, you, know, uh, you have to have a certain amount of intelligence. Um, and, uh, uh, but people who are good at getting, you know, A's, good at following the rules, uh, not making trouble. And uh, then, you know, once you become a professional philosopher, you have to publish in, uh, you know, good journals and, you know, that means publishing on kind of hot topics. Uh, maybe that might not be very intrinsically interesting or important, but that's just sort of what the journals are interested in right now. You know, at every level, there's selection for uh, conformity and rule following. And, uh, you know, nowadays, if you, you know, to get into, a, you know, a good PhD program in philosophy, you're expected to have a GPA upwards of you know, 3.8 out of 4. Um, in many cases, it will be higher. Um, so you don't have a lot of room for arguing with your professor. Um, or, uh, you know, kind of goofing off, doing your own thing, even though those, that people who do those things might have personalities that make them suitable for tackling new problems and from a new perspective. But they're going to be, in the most cases, just filtered out and they'll never become academics or philosophers. Uh, so, um, you know, things, things worked out for me, um, although it, it, it wasn't, uh, the, the route was, it was a bit of bumpy. Um, actually after, uh, my undergraduate degree, I was rejected from every, uh, PhD program I applied to. Uh, so I had a year where I had nothing. Then uh, the only PhD program I got into was at uh, uh, Lingnan University in uh, Hong Kong, which is actually where I wanted to go. Uh, 
because for some uh, various reasons, but um, they weren't rolling out the red carpet for me. Although, um, you know, in terms of uh, you know, test scores and other things, uh, I, I um, probably should have been admitted. But my, you know, GP, my undergraduate record was just a bit low. Um, and uh, I think they could, you could tell if you don't advertise your, uh, how woke you are, that means you're a conservative. So mm. that was also, uh, I think, a problem. You, you hadn't written anything to, uh, out there at that point. So ultimately, I, I left Lingnan. Uh, and I, uh, so I got a master's degree at Cambridge. And I did, uh, I did quite well in the uh, master's program. Um, and uh, I, uh, my writing sample had been published in the top specialty journal in my field. Um, and uh, uh, you know, I had other positives uh, to my application. It was a very strong application uh, the second time around. Um, but I was again rejected from every PhD program in the United States. Um, and I, actually at that time I had written about race. So, um, that my first published paper was, uh, was about, uh, race differences and, um, whether we should support the noble why. Yeah, I think a, a, a lot of people, not necessarily the, the core audience of this podcast, but I think a lot of people don't really understand what is not under question, even for people who debate the, the question or, you know, what attack the question of, of studying race differences and, and IQ. The existence of race differences in IQ with pretty much every measured test across history, region, and stuff is not debated. That's not something that, you know, even the people who are against studying this would question. What is typically questioned are, you know, is the feasibility of this or that measure of, you know, ask, asking the question in itself, you know, what is, what is IQ, what is race, you know, it's essentially kind of just trying to disassemble the equation from, from its separate entities. So I think that's just a, a thing to, to establish, like, you know, that's not really under question. Well, uh, there was a hit piece about me in the Daily Mail referring to my so-called race gaps in IQ. Um, so, I mean, some people really are that ignorant about it. Um, yeah, most of the popular press, and that's why I want to kind of make this point. It's like, you know, he's uh, alleged so-called, you know, he, he hints that there might be, I mean, there are. The question is, you know, what are they based on? You know, this is the more friendly approach to this. You know, what could it be? You know, culture, genetics, oppression. There's all sorts of things that could be in the mix for this. Um, you know, what is IQ? Is it, a, is it a viable measure? You know, could we be using something else? What is race? That's another thing. You know, people say, oh, you know, race is not a good, a good category. It's not a stable way of looking at things because you know, just to look at Africa, there's more genetic diversity in Africa than anywhere else, which are all true. But, you know, it's kind of evading the question that actually, you know, this is a thing that exists and makes very good predictions the way it is. So I feel like most of the discussions around this are just kind of trying to obfuscate rather than, you know, focus on the thing. So for, for a while, the argument was um, you can't identify different races based on DNA. Um, so Craig Venter said, uh, um, I think right after the, the genome was sequenced, uh, that you can't tell if someone is African based on their DNA. Um, so, I mean, that, uh, lie became, you know, untenable, you know, after, you know, 23andMe and people... They can tell you exactly where you came from and what your your race is. Um, so they don't say that explicitly, but th you know they they just uh, try to bamboozle people by throwing out 
um, these statements, which uh, some of them are just false and some of them are maybe true but irrelevant to to the point and people want to believe it. So they just accept. And they say we're all 99.9% the same, which isn't true. But anyway, even if it were true, I mean, we know that, okay, uh, Shaquille O'Neal, uh, Woody Allen, and George Bush are 99.9% the same. Does that mean they all have the same talents and the uh, same you know, interests and personality and abilities? Um, probably not. And it's not only because some some special training that Shaquille O'Neal received in childhood, but Woody Allen didn't, that makes Shaquille O'Neal a great basketball player. Uh, it's that 0.1% difference in their DNA that's making a, a big difference. So we see there are differences between people. So, you know, why not between groups? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the, the factor of, of of wanting to believe it is is uh, is important because, yeah. I mean, it's the implications are are tough to stomach, um, especially because it's you know it's, the the question is intelligence. We've reached a point in, um, in in kind of the the history of the world where it really you can't really get around the fact that intelligence is valuable it really is valuable for you know it correlates with a lot of you know positive life outcomes you know you can make you can uh, attain status through intelligence you can make money through intelligence you can you can essentially do all the things that people want to do uh to get to become higher ups in in the society and you know it i think it's it is in the interest of people who are higher up as well to downplay the importance of intelligence because it's easier to say okay yeah you know i've just climbed my way up through hard work and i've just worked harder and um and yeah it's just working much much harder than anyone else and 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 that's it don't don't look into this question much more, much closer so um I, what do you think about this as kind of uh you know the people who are already in the elite trying to maybe suppress questions about this stuff because it's not in their advantage to, you know, have their um, privileges questioned. Well, uh, going back historically to the, uh, to the origins of the, the you know, blank slatism, race denial, and uh, that kind of thing, um, I think it was just, um, it was largely wishful thinking. Um, so if there are biological constraints on you know, what kind of uh, political system we can adapt ourselves to, uh, you know, what we can aspire to uh, you know, morally, um, that makes people feel bad, right? So they say, they just deny it. That's how how human thought process sometimes works. And also, um, in uh, social science, there was a professional incentive for you know, anthropologists and uh, other people in similar areas to deny the power of biology because that infringed on their field. From a professional perspective, it was more desirable to say that it's all cultural it's all culture and we study culture. So we're the only people who can comment on human behavior. Um, I think those are the two main uh, forces that led to the, uh, the rise of these um, false beliefs. Uh, and then once you... And also, you know, people who have been successful as a result of intelligence or, uh, you know, other talents, um, it can seem, you know, unfair that they, you know, as you're saying, that they benefit from just uh, the genetic lottery. 
Uh, so, you know, from some perspective, it can seem that you justify it by saying, no, it's not, it's not the genetic lottery. It's working hard. Um, Shaquille O'Neal just worked really hard. Uh, and uh, you can too. So, you know, don't ask anything of me because, you know. Um, and now, of course, uh, when you have a multi racial society with uh, disparities among groups, then there's another political dimension. It's just, uh, you know, being open about these things can lead to hurt feelings and uh, political conflict. So now you have, uh, um, that's a, you know, an incentive not to, uh, not to uh, get into these things. Yeah, and it, it is easier than actually, I mean, to, to even begin to address these problems while, you know, maintaining a multi, multi-racial, multi-ethnic societies and all this is an immense undertaking. Uh, it, it does feel much easier, much more convenient for people who are in, you know, so-called like, cognitive elite to, to cultivate this um, pretty much kind of intra, intra-ethnic uh, conflict with people who are, you know, maybe of, of a, a lower caste where they just say, okay, you know, these people, um, they're the enemy. They don't understand that, you know, they don't understand equality. They have prejudice, they're bigoted um, and, you know, kind of point the, the, the whole system against whatever the, the so-called imagined redneck type person who, who represents the, uh, represents pretty much the, the, the evil in, in, in all the world. I mean, this is a, the, the antagonist that I've grown up with as well. Like just watching American television, you know, it's always like some unsophisticated, you know, Bible thumping, uh, you know, redneck person who's, um, you know, uh, tied into some some terrible, unexplained um, tradition, uh, and that you know suppresses everything that is good and new and true and authentic in the world. Um, and you know, it, it it does feel much much easier than actually you know the deciding. And it also solves some some like I said some class issues, and and especially in the U.S. because a lot of these discussions come from the U.S. I mean, the fact that. You know, we were even talking about this, uh, you know, that this is even even interesting stems from the fact that there are intra-ethnic and inter- interracial problems in the U.S. where essentially all of the culture trickles down from and we all just, uh, we all just battle the, the, the problems in the U.S. Also, um, when uh, these ideas were, you know, originally promoted, uh, they probably seem like relatively harmless, you know, lies, white lies that weren't going to have major consequences. Like, yeah, we'd just say that everyone's the same. So maybe many people were suspicious of these new ideas, but, um, you know, just went along with it because it wasn't, didn't seem like a big deal. Um, but, uh, you know, as, uh, uh, Nietzsche says in the, the son that becomes conviction and the father would, would, in the father was still a lie. Um, you know, one generation kind of goes along with it just because, um, uh, you know, it doesn't seem important. Uh, and then, but the children, you know, take it seriously and, uh, maybe start thinking about the implications and, uh, you know that's what led that's what's led to the current situation uh where now uh, the young generation is really taking these ideas seriously that we're we're literally the same and diff and the you know there's no good explanation for disparities other than whites did something wrong um which is what previous generations had said the same thing. They just didn't really believe it in their heart. Um, and now people do believe it, and uh, which is leading to this chaos. Yeah, and the reality is that, you know, on the ground, things do look like they are getting worse. I mean, you know, Thomas Sowell kind of famously discusses 
Um, you know, he, he's not necessarily a hereditary and he doesn't, you know, follow this, but, you know, he was outlining how culture uh, was quite different, you know, when he was growing up in, in Harlem in, I don't know, the 1930s or something like that. And that, you know, it was you know peaceful type of, you know, you could walk through the park, you could, you know, it's like culture was a kind of a mediating factor there. Um, and a lot of people who, you know, tend to criticize my, you know, my channel because I, I do bring on hereditarians and I personally also kind of um, am interested in this and I, I tend to agree. Um, you know, why are we not discussing culture? I mean, what do you see the, the role of culture here? Um, you know, what what is culture? Why is it important? Why is it not important? Well, uh, I mean, of course, um, what happens that uh, culture is not a direct expression of uh, biology. I mean, uh, so there's a there's an interaction between you know culture, which is constantly evolving, and um, then the dis- distribution of uh, of genes. So, of course, you can look. Uh, there are many many examples of you know, large changes in uh, behavior that are driven by culture and not by genes. Uh, But uh, then, of course, one can't then leap the the conclusion that it's all culture. Uh, Culture just, it is a factor and uh, no one uh, really denies that. Um, But Biology is always going to be uh, exerting some, you know, influence. And if uh, populations have different biological dispositions, then they'll tend to push them in slightly different directions. Yeah, I mean, I, I always bring up this example. Like, if you ever go to like I don't know, little little Bucharest in in London or something like that, or Little Seoul or something like that, you know. Obviously, they're almost like one-to-one recreations from from the places that people hail from. I mean, you could say that this is, you know, partly they're bringing their culture, but it's almost like, you know, if you see an ant colony, they build a certain type of, you know, uh, complicated uh, cathedral-like structure, and you know, you move it to a different continent, and surprise, surprise, it creates the same little cathedral-like structure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 mean I think that's one of the strongest pieces of evidence for. Uh, for race differences, I mean, if the the so-called culture follows the genes wherever they go, then you know that's prima facie evidence that there's some relation with uh, that the genes are having an influence. Yeah, because I mean, a, a lot of people who like you know, like myself, I went, I lived in the UK for a long time, and you know, you want to integrate. Um, you know, it's, people don't go to a country and say, I will not integrate, you know, maybe a few of them, you know, are very angry when they, when they go to a different country, but usually they go because there are opportunities, there's a chance of, of a different life, but then somehow you've literally fall into a, a neighborhood that is pretty much exactly like the one you left. Talk to people that are pretty much exactly like the ones you, you, you left back home. And it is just, it kind of just feels much easier to integrate into stuff that you, you know, you've already left from, from, from back home. So, yeah, I don't know. Like I said, this is, you know, obviously there's culture is a, is a big thing here, but, you know, like you said, the fact that it's, uh, it's resistant to the host culture is also interesting as well. I, I mean, of course, there's influence from the host culture as well. It's not exactly the same, but it's some of the same general patterns are, uh, emerging, uh, again and again, like, um, Koreans who have been in America for multiple generations have attitudes towards education that are perhaps intermediate between, you know, Koreans in Korea and, you know, the white um, dominant culture in America. Uh, So there's, you know, it's not a perfect expression of, of the genetic tendencies, but there yeah. seems to be, you know, I think there's also kind of the question, because, you know, a lot of kind of pushback that I get is like, okay, let's say, let's say culture is more important. I wonder what cultural interventions people see that are possible um, that are not absolutely authoritarian and brutal in the sense that, okay, you know, like 
you know, the example is like, oh, if, if you'd raise someone like, a, you know, let's say an African-American child as a Korean child, um, you know, obviously putting aside adoption studies and stuff like that, that we know, uh, you know, that would be a very potent force to, you know, force that child into education and rigorous diet and I don't know exactly what it involves, but it's, yeah, it would be a more, it's a different thing, but how this would be in any way policy and how this, you know, would contravene to any sort of, you know, basis of liberalism. I, I don't understand. Maybe nudge people in the direction of being more Korean, but it's, uh, it sounds well, a bit brutal. Well, I mean, if you would, if, uh, you know, blacks raised by Koreans grew up to be exactly like Koreans, that would be an extraordinary, uh, you know, discovery with um, lots of implications. I mean, that would show that there really is something about Korean culture that uh, produces these uh, these differences. Um, so, I mean, if uh, we were to make that discovery, then it would suggest that we can do that. Culture is much more powerful than than we thought, and then we should at least, you know, th then finding out what it is about Korean culture that produces these outcomes would be the most important social scientific question. Um, uh, so, of course, you know, having all black children adopted by Koreans wouldn't be the solution, but it would still point us in the direction of a solution. But as a matter of fact, uh, you know, adoption studies suggest that uh, it doesn't make such a huge difference, um, at least by uh, adulthood. So, um, yeah, <laughs> stop worrying about it. Yeah, I mean, this is yeah, exa exactly. It's like uh, we we could study this if it if we didn't already. <laughs> but I guess yeah, I don't know. The the number of adoption studies probably relatively limited, just because you know the implications are kind of suspicious. <laughs> Uh, I mean, ideally, we could do a controlled experiment, but that's probably not going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> we don't live in that world. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, we're just, we're just going to flip, flip, flip your children and and see what happens. Yeah, we're not <laughs> we're not at that stage of civilization. I mean, if it if it would resolve a tremendously important issue. I yeah, think thinking like a scientist, but yeah, <laughs> I don't know if anyone would volunteer. Um, and yeah, for, for good reason, who knows? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to uh, leave the question of the JQ completely, because like I said, I know uh, a lot of people are interested. Maybe we could go for just a few of the of the arguments that, that McDonald brings. And like you said, you know, you've taken this this book seriously. You didn't say, okay, Kevin McDonald is an absolute terrible anti-Semite. You know, he's, he's, he's fueled by hatred and, you know, he, he makes arguments. You look at them, and you know you you tell me why uh, why they're not um, they're not as solid as as, as people think. Um, I think one of the the major arguments uh, he makes, and I think also Ed Dutton, who's also been on the show, he makes this as well that uh, Jewish people tend to be a higher in, in ethnocentrism, so called hyper ethnocentrism. Um, I mean, you could you could see this in the sense that you know there is in you know in big cities, like I said, there's a little Bucharest quite a lot of ethnocentrism there as well. There's also, you know, little Jewish quarters and, and things like that where, you know, people tend to congregate and, and help each other out. And, you know, they have sprawling family businesses, pretty much like any sort of Southern European family, but just that's as, as a parallel. Um, uh, but, you know, why are they different in ethnocentrism from from other populations? Or if they're not, why, why is that? Um, so there are a few points to make. First, I mean, ethnocentrism is, uh, I think, clearly highly influenced by the environment. So if we were having this discussion, um, you know, 80, 90 years ago, we would say that Germans are the most ethnocentric people. And what makes Germans so ethnocentric? Of course, now no one is saying that. Uh, they With their they've policies of open borders and multiculturalism and all that, uh, so ethnocentrism is not, you know, and differences in ethnocentrism are clearly not stable in the way that IQ differences are. Um, now, are Jews more ethnocentric? I mean, how is that uh, being measured? 
Um, now you ask somebody on a, on a survey, are you proud to be Jewish or something like that? And Jews are more likely to say that they're proud to be Jewish than someone is to say they're proud to be white. Um, does that, does that really mean Jews are more ethnocentric? Uh, I mean, or is that just because minorities are encouraged to be proud of themselves? So if you ask, are you proud of your minority status? People say yes, are more likely to say yes. Whereas being proud of being white is, uh, you know, highly stigmatized. Um, I mean, I think we have to think critically about you know these kind this kind of uh, evidence. It doesn't necessarily indicate that there's some uh, important difference in ethnocentrism between uh, you know white Gentiles and Jews, and certainly doesn't suggest that there's a, an innate difference uh, favoring Jews. Now, regarding the evidence against Jews being ethnocentric. Um, I mean, McDonald and others have made a number of highly misleading or outright false statements about, you know, for example, the policies of uh, reform Jews or the uh, the positions of liberal uh, Jews when it comes to America versus Israel, Israeli immigration policy. If you go, uh, I'm sure, if you go to Reform Judaism org right now uh, you'll see a bunch of pictures of black people of black Jews and Hispanic Jews and Asian Jews right on their banner every time I check because becoming uh, multiracial is a major priority of the reform Jewish community uh, and liberal Jews were especially liberal American Jews were instrumental in promoting multiracial immigration to Israel. Um, the, uh, for example, the Ethiopian Jews who are uh, not genetically related to other Jewish populations and quite large numbers of them. Um, you know, McDonald repeatedly sa- has repeatedly stated, even after I corrected him, that uh, Immigration to Israel was restricted to Jews who can prove their Jewish ancestry. In fact, if you have one Jewish grandparent, you can bring you you can bring your entire family to Israel. So you, your spouse is zero percent Jewish. Your spouse can go to Israel with you. Um, and uh, there have been uh, there's some uh, there have been hundreds of thousands of immigrants to. Israel from uh, the former Soviet Union who have distant Jewish ancestry or no Jewish ancestry at all. Um, and, uh, you know, this is not the, uh, the uh, you know, racially pure ethno state that, uh, you know, has been claimed by uh, people like, uh, like McDonald. Um, now, one uh expression of ethnocentrism would be marrying within your group which is one of the most basic things you can do and uh you know intermarriage among uh liberal among uh, reform and non-affiliated Jews is something in surveys uh around 59% say that they are uh, intermarried although um, you know, this is probably uh, an underestimate because uh, when uh, Reform Jews marry uh, non-Jews, the spouse often undergoes a uh, you know nominal Reform conversion, which is not a real conversion according to Jewish law. So it's really um, you know quite a lot of mixed marriages like that, um, and. Uh, you know, as a result of that, the uh, non-Orthodox population in uh, in America is disappearing. Uh, so now Dutton and uh, then also McDonald picked up this argument, have said that, well, Jews are more likely to marry each other than if people married by randomly, if Jews are 2% of the population. 
you know, there would still be a lot less than uh, um, uh, marriage between between Jews. Um, now, one point I'd make is McDonald explicitly stated he predicted that intermarriage rates would go down. The Jewish community would uh, counteract the tendency toward intermarriage to preserve the racial purity of the gene pool. So it didn't happen like that. Now he changed the argument to, well, Jewish, Jewish marriages are more common than would be expected by chance. But, you know, there are a lot of reasons why Jews might uh, be more likely to marry each other besides, uh, you know, high levels of ethnocentrism. Now, ethnocentrism, is part of it because all groups are ethnocentric, uh, including Jews, and also they have a different religion. Other people aren't, don't necessarily prefer to marry Jews, so the decisions of non-Jews are also a factor. Um, so the the totality of the evidence uh, just doesn't support the picture painted by the JQers now. I, when I have drawn attention to these facts, um, you know, McDonald and others, to, for the most part, they just ignore it. And they immediately, you know, as soon as I turn my back, they've gone back to saying that Israeli immigration is restricted to Jews who can prove their Jewish ancestry and, um, and so on. But almost every piece of evidence that has been presented to support the Jewish ethnocentrism hypothesis is... Uh, 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 extremely questionable. Yeah, I think one of the, the major arguments that comes up is that there are certain um, Jewish kind of intellectual thought leaders on the left who pretty much explicitly say that, um, you know, cultivating multiculturalism, um, cultivating, you know, cosmopolitanism is the the only way to ensure that Western societies will be safe for Jews. I mean, you know, you could, there are different clips of different people in, in higher up positions saying this. Um, a lot of people say, okay, you know, this is obviously not, it's not even gotcha. It's just, you know, like revelation of the method uh, by the cabal. Um, but I mean, what do you say about this? I mean, this, you know, sounds like a, a plausible strategy for what, you know, kind of Jewish groups are accused of the fact that they've, um, I know, promoted multiculturalism as much as they could. Um, yeah, because they have this kind of tension with the West. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, Jews have to some extent been pushed in this direction. And one of my um, uh, points is that uh, why, you know, Jews are disproportionately on the left. Uh, they are on the right too, but there's, they're not they're overrepresented on the right, but not to the same extent as on the left. And an important reason for that is anti-Semitism on the right. Um, and uh, you know, I I give examples, especially in my last paper, um, uh, just published a few we weeks ago. Still no evidence for a Jewish group evolutionary strategy. Uh, I give examples of. Um, you know, far right movements where Jews have taken leadership roles and where the movement has inevitably turned on the Jews who, you know, were its original promoters. Um, and, uh, you know, a number of experiences like this have certainly, you know, taught Jews a lesson about what they can expect from, uh, from, nationalists from white nationalists when white nationalists take power as happened uh one of my examples is fascism in italy which was originally perceived as a jewish movement and the ideas uh which were uh, you know attributed to mussolini uh many of them were originally formulated by a jewish woman uh margarita sarfati who uh ended up having to flee for her life well Many of her family members were then killed in the Italian Holocaust. Um, uh, you know, it's happened on a much smaller scale um, in white nationalist movements in uh, in the U.S. Uh, I mean, it, 
in the American Renaissance, for example, which is not anti-Semitic. Um, nevertheless, I mean, there are so many, there's so much anti-Semitism among the rank, rank and file that, you know, most of the Jews, you know, four of the 10 speakers at the first American Renaissance conference were Jews. Uh, and many speakers at subsequent conferences, many of their biggest supporters. Um, and, uh, you know, there's been a big drop in Jewish support as, uh, you know, because of anti-Semitism, because uh, that's just, that's something that just happens to, uh, in white nationalist movements, even when all the evidence suggests that Jews are following the rules and, uh, doing what the white nationalists want them to eventually, um, you know, they say we're different and you can't be part of the movement. So, you know, this and other, you know, cultural experiences have certainly made Jews uh, suspicious of anything, you know, uh, you know, resembling for white nationalism. Um, now, why do Jews say, well, you will find some Jews. This is not particularly common. I mean, there are a few examples which are, you know, promoted over and over again, like the Barbara Lerner Spectre, um, some random, you know, woman with no real uh, influence makes a statement and then we're hearing about it for years and years. Um, but, now that multiculturalism is uh, considered great, open borders are considered great, um, some Jews just want to take credit for that because they think, because that's considered good. So they say, yeah, we did that. It's because, <laughs> you know, and we win a lot of Nobel Prizes and look at all this other great, and, uh, you know, we invented the idea of animal rights and, uh, um, you know, all these other things that Jews uh might say to because they think that uh, that makes Jews look good. So, I mean, you you know, a lot of when you have a, a narrative that you want to promote, you know, it's sometimes possible to find these examples that seem to support it. But you know, you can do that on the other side too. I mean, uh, the uh, the anti racists can find examples of whites being racist. And they do, right? That They find a, a, a small number of examples that conform to that their narrative. And, uh, you know, they put it on television and we hear about it over and over and over and over again. But not seeing the bigger picture, uh, you know, did... Were Jews really responsible for coming up with all these ideas about blank slavism and uh, why immigration is good? Um, and, uh, you know, to determine that, you have to look more carefully at the evidence, not just find one, an example or several examples of random Jews saying something that seems to support, support what you think. Uh, Yes, I think um, I just I had a conversation with some an acquaintance who happens to be Jewish uh, about you know why they uh, you know they're kind of orbiting the kind of the more far right space, but you know dipping their toe, not really you know committing to any of it. And essentially, that was his conclusion as well. It's like okay, it's um, you know it's there's a there's an energy around the space that essentially tells tells me that you know it's fine to 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 chat around it, but, you know, at, at the point where this becomes actual state, uh, ideology, you know, I'm in trouble and the people I care about are in trouble. And, you know, even if there are truths encased within this ideology that are interesting to me as someone who wants to debate this stuff, um, the danger supersedes, you know, my curiosity about this stuff. So, you know, it's, and even though I'm not a white nationalist, um, I mean, my wife is Korean. I spend most of my time in Korea. Um, so I'm not a white nationalist, but sometimes people think I am. And uh, then they make a point of telling me to get lost because I'm Jewish. I mean, that happens uh, quite regularly. Um, so, 
I mean, that's, uh, um, you know, just the same, it, it works the same way with blacks and whites as it does with whites and Jews, right? And if uh, you're just going to choose select leaders of the far right movement based on, you know, their uh, ability to promote the you know, these ideas, their verbal ability, uh, their political savvy, you know, Jews will be conspicuously overrepresented. Um, and, uh, a lot of people just can't, can't accept that. Uh, so they're going to, uh, become, they're going to turn on the Jews. And the, the reality is if you, um, just uh, if Amer- if you took people who believe in race differences um, for good or bad reasons, and you put that group of people in charge of America right now, I think that that would that that would not end well for Jews. Um, so, uh, of course, the J cures will say, "Yeah, but it's the why? Why are we anti-Semitic? You know, where did the anti-Semitism come from? Come from, right? They'll say it came from from uh, uh, from Jews doing bad things." So, yeah, I, you know what? My just personal experience with this, and you know, I think this is you know pretty compelling. Like, there's no there's no smoke without fire. Uh, I understand where people are coming from, but just. My family's experience, I'm not Jewish, but I'm, my family's like ethnically German, ethnically Polish. We live in like different enclaves within Romania, which is also kind of, you know, there's all sorts of ethnic tensions here. You know, my family particularly was persecuted by both the communists and the fascists. Uh, subsequently, you know, there's all sorts of things. And the politics of resentment between ethnic groups I think people underestimate how important this is. You know, this was a huge factor in, in communism itself. Like it was a huge upheaval where this energy was harnessed. The hatred between the person who, um, you know, was was had had more wealth and the person who didn't, the person from a, a more, I know, min- minority background who was maybe disadvantaged in a certain, the fact that, you know, someone just put a, a torch and a pitchfork in their hand and said, you know, go, go after the, the boyar, go after the kulak, you know. This is an immense source of energy. And, you know, I feel like people underestimate this. And, you know, it, it, like the, the whole region that I live in here, like the, the most beautiful palaces and the most beautiful houses used to be owned by Jews. Not many Jews left here. You know, they were made. The things that people come to this region for to, to view as beautiful and, you know, as timeless, they were constructed by Jews, merchants, and, and people who were living in this area who don't live here now. And I mean... These are just little things, obviously. This is a very subjective interpretation. But like I said, I've made this show to report on my view of the world as I see it. Because I, like I said, there's a difference between how I see the world and how people tell me I should see the world. And even if people on my side are telling me I should see the world in a very specific way, I have to first give um, give credence to my lying eyes. And then we'll talk about the theory. So, um, yeah, that's just my background here. It's... Every time you have, you know, a minority being, you know, really su- conspicuously cons- successful, you get the same reaction. You, they, and the same accusations are made that are made against Jews, that they're scheming, that they're cheating, uh, that they're stealing the wealth from others. And then when that group is then kicked out, then they find out actually it wasn't true. They were doing something useful. Um, you know, Chinese and Southeast Asia. I mean, there have been many examples. I guess Germans and um, in uh, other c- countries throughout Europe who were uh, conspicuously successful. It's always the same, uh, the same reaction. So, um, uh, that uh, I think is the the main the main factor, and there are others, and also you know. Jewish behavior. Um, I don't think uh, you know Jews are um, much better or worse than any other than other groups. So uh, 
you know, Jews have done bad things. Like, and there have been, you know, cases where, you know, when there's a group group conflict, it can be the fault of one or the other or both. So, you know, uh, Jewish behavior has also um, sometimes had something to do with uh, with anti-Semitism. Uh, I'm not, you know, denying that or saying Jews never did anything wrong. But uh, whatever Jews do, you know, as long as they're conspicuously successful and more likely to, you know, attain uh, leadership positions, uh, they're going to elicit this uh, negative reaction from many people. Yeah. Like you said, it's it's multifactorial, but yeah, you know, I think extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And it, from, from your perspective, that evidence, we're st- it's the, the jury's still out. It's still not in here. But yeah, we shouldn't dismiss these theories. Just, yeah, a priori, they, they exist out there and they should be studied and discussed and you know, I think these people should be at the table um, because they are at the table if you like it or not. I mean, this information is out there. So before I let you go, I want to ask you the question of the show. Um, I think I forgot to to warn you about this question, but everyone gets this question. So maybe, you know, just, uh, just uh, wing it. <laughs> if you have a subversive thinker that you'd like to recommend to people, you know, maybe someone who's influential in, in your thinking, you know, someone that you, you've read and you know, has been interesting and um, is maybe underrated or people just don't read enough of. Um, so somebody who uh, you know, most of the people I would recommend would be well known to your listeners, but someone they might not know is Nevin Sesserditch. Uh, I mentioned that I spent three years at Lingnan University in Hong Kong. Uh, that was to work with, uh, with Nevin and uh, he's a philosopher of biology and uh, influenced my uh, decision to go into uh, philosophy of biology. Uh, he's known, uh, uh, his uh, most well-known work is on uh, heritability, um, the uh, reality of race, uh, and uh, he's written some other um, on some other topics which didn't receive uh, quite as much attention on uh, equality, um, bias in, uh, in academia. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would uh, recommend that people look into that. Excellent. Thank you. That's a, that's a unique recommendation. And I do, I do want to point people towards uh, ne- Nevin Sesserditch. Sesserditch. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Nathan. Is there any place you'd like to point people uh, to your work? Um, so uh, all my papers are uh, on my website, uh, nathankoffness.com. Uh, I have a section, if they're interested in the debate with Kevin McDonald, uh, there's a section with uh, our uh, uh, entire exchange, uh, my papers and his reply. I would point out that on his website, the front page of his website, he uh, has links to all his papers in the debate and his response to Goffness or the second response to Goffness, but not to any of mine. But uh, you can go to, to my website. You can get my uh, you can get my side of the debate and his are both linked uh, linked there. Uh, and I'm on Twitter uh, at Nathan Goffness. Excellent. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you so much, Nathan, for coming on. Ah, thank you. <laughs>